Hello, and welcome to Redaction Report for the first of our 2022 extended shows. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing a range of topics um, that have been covered in world politics this week. I'm joined today by Redaction's Middle East and North Africa editor, Kit Roberts, who's here to help us understand the war in Syria, among uh, other issues. Kit, how's things going? Hi. Not too bad, thank you. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, today we're going to start by taking a look at a country that's barely been out of the news over the past decade, that is Syria. Um, this war was, of course, started after the Assad regime brutally cracked down on protesters, demanding greater freedom and democracy, uh, which was part uh, of the wider spring Arab, uh, sorry, wider Arab Spring protests. Um, fast forward nearly 11 years now, and the country's, uh, I think it's fair to say, has been absolutely devastated. Uh, numerous sides locked in conflict for over a decade, including the Assad regime itself, numerous rebel groups, the Kurdish militias uh, in the north, uh, and uh, Daesh. Um, reports of war crimes and various atrocities have been leveled against many sides in this conflict. Uh, notably, for one, the use of chemical weapons by the Assad regime uh, against his own civilians. Uh, various international players have also intervened in this war uh, to varying extents, including the United States, including Russia, and including Turkey. Excuse me. Um, however, uh, it's now been announced that Syria has signed a memorandum of understanding with China's Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, this is Xi Jinping's flagship initiative to reframe international trade around China. It's been going on uh, for much of the past uh, half decade or so. Uh, it's based on the old Silk Roads. Uh, that's the sort of dream that Xi Jinping has been trying to big up and romanticize this project. Um, much of the initiative has involved investment in infrastructure, such as rail and ports around uh, the globe, but many of its critics have attacked this project as economic imperialism and as debt trap diplomacy. Kit, from the point of view of Syria, what was your reaction to this announcement? What do you think the Assad regime is trying to gain here? What, what is very important to remember with Syria at the moment is we now have a country that has been absolutely devastated by 10 years of war now. Um, the infrastructure in the company is in tatters. You've had large swathes of its major cities that are effectively in ruins. And some of them, particularly up in the north of the country, were cities like Aleppo, for example. <clears throat> There's a huge infrastructure problem, which is only going to exacerbate um, the enormous economic challenges that the country is going to be facing over the coming years as well. So just because... It, it's, it, you could definitely make the case that militarily the war is probably now as good as finished and the, that the Assad regime has managed to hold its position. But in terms of how they're going to be moving forward uh, in the country, it, it, they need some kind of support, basically. And even though they do have some international backing from Iran, they do have some international backing from Russia. Neither of those countries is really in any position to be able to help them out financially, really. Iran is currently seeing its own fuel shortages, which is going to like, have a knock-on effect uh, in terms of uh, fuel supplies that are moving into other countries in the region, which includes Syria. And Russia is obviously seeing its own economic problems at the moment as well, and is preoccupied on its, uh, its western border too in Ukraine as well, which we'll get to later. Um, so basically, neither of these countries, even though they are they have been propping up the Assad regime is really in much of a position to support it economically to the degree that it's going to need to stand any chance of a recovery over the next few years. I mean, I don't think there is going to be much of a recovery, regardless of what help there is, because the devastation is just too um, widespread and too deep, basically. But this may well be a way of trying to get some sort of backing um, that will help some kind of infrastructure rebuilding and some kind of like beginnings of um, rebuilding the damage that's been happening over the last 10 years. And what sort of damage have we seen? Because obviously one of the most um, shocking moments perhaps uh, that, that was reported in the West was the destruction of the ancient temple of Palmyra by Daesh um, mm -hmm. 
back uh, at the height of their power. But of course, um, the devastation goes far beyond that. You know, we've seen Syria's infrastructure almost completely taken out by the war. Um, mm -hmm. How much is it going to take to rebuild Syria? I think we're talking generations, basically. This, um, in terms of the the physical recovery, the infrastructural recovery, we're still talking years and years and years. This is this is something which has ripped the heart out of an entire country. Um, the actual infrastructure rebuilding, the damage, the physical damage to it. I mean, of course, the ancient city of uh, Palmyra is is irreplaceable, but that's just one aspect of it. Talking in terms of like the actual the, the country's ability to function, um, that's going to take decades, I would think. And in terms of, of course, the actual um, psychological impact or emotional impact that it's had on the people, in terms of the mass emigration that's happened as well, it's going to be generations, I think, before we can see anything like a functioning country. Um, even with that backing. But of course, um, we, a lot of commentators have talked about the war largely being over. Uh, the Assad regime does now control most of the territory in Syria, but in the northern provinces especially, especially in the northwest, there is still some conflict going on. Could you explain to us what's happening there? Well, we still have a few territories in the north of the country that are just about that are holding out. But in terms of the actual uh, strategic value and the, the actual strategic sort of um, conflict that's happened, it is effectively finished. I don't know if we're going to see any um, advances into those territories by the Assad regime in the future. It's certainly possible. It's certainly not something that um, I would rule out. Um, but in terms of the actual strategic import and the, the ability of the people to actually effectively oppose Assad. It's not really about that anymore. It's about survival, effectively. Um, unfortunately, I think we have seen from uh, the international backing of the Assad regime, many people would say that Russia's, the moment of Russia's intervention, <clears throat> which is possibly orchestrated by um, uh, Iranian allies as well, maybe, um, as a moment which effectively ensure the survival of uh, Bashar al-Assad in his position. Certainly he's beholden to those allies, but he is still in his position and he is still alive, which is a lot more than can be said from similar long-term Arab dictators that faced uprising in the Arab Spring. Um, what I think is really important now is that uh, the international community opposes any attempt to normalize relations with Syria and I think or with the Assad regime in particular and what I think is a little bit disturbing about Syria signing into the Belt and Road Initiative is that this is an acknowledgement of the legitimacy of the Assad regime as well it's not I mean sure in terms of actual economic recovery in terms of rebuilding infrastructure it might help but it is a tacit acknowledgement of the regime's legitimacy which is something that really does need to be opposed by the international community this is not something uh, which is positive in that regard at all yes uh, i mean let's talk through that for a minute because uh, the reason why uh, it's important like you say that um the international community does not legitimize uh, the assad regime is due to the numerous numerous um reports of uh, war crimes uh, against his regime, including the use of chemical weapons against civilians. Uh, could you talk us through what that's entailed? Because it's something a lot of people have heard about tangentially, but don't know too much about in detail. And of course, there are a lot of, um, there's a lot of denialism floating around out there as well. Could you talk us through that? Well, we've had a very important moment uh, as regards the Syrian regime in recent weeks, because we have had the conviction uh, of a former regime official in Germany uh, of crimes against humanity, which is a very big moment um, because it is a legal acknowledgement that the regime has been committing war crimes. So some of the crimes that this official, former official, was, was convicted of do include torture. They do include his working at a prison, which oversaw 
regular torture and all manner of just horrible things happening to the people who are being imprisoned there. This is a very important moment because we do have now a legal international acknowledgement that this has happened in the regime. There are other cases that are being prepared as well. And as far as I understand it, the legal teams behind this ruling um, that have worked for this ruling and the advocacy groups that surround them want to go as far as they can. They want to go as high up as they can in the regime. Um, how that's, that's going to be an enormous challenge. Um, I think it would need a lot more backing from the international community than it currently has, but that's definitely a positive step to see that happening. Um, as regards the um, treatment of civilians within Syria, there's, there's not a great deal to say that hasn't already been said, really. The um, secret services are effectively terrorize the population. There's multiple reports, it's very well documented. There's some stories from survivors that attest that they effectively use um, kidnap and disappearance, but also amnesty as a way, uh, as a weapon against population, to, against the population to sow fear. It's, um, yeah, what can you say? It's just awful. It's truly, truly awful. Um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and of course, there have been several times throughout the war when it looked like Assad may be going the same way as Gaddafi and maybe going the same way as Mubarak, and that he would be the latest in a line of uh, Arab dictators to fall during the Arab Spring. What saved him? Well, I think there's two things that saved him, and that has just been the, the intervention of regional international allies. So yes, um, Assad's army was not doing so great at one point during the conflict, but then you have Iranian interference when you have uh, proxies in Hezbollah coming over from Lebanon. This is uh, an intervention that continues very strongly. There's a lot of back and forth over the, border, the Syrian and Lebanese border with Hezbollah fighters moving back and forth there as well. Um, but I think the main moment which scuppered any chances um, of any intervention possibly from Western countries and European countries was Russia's intervention. Uh, this has provided him with an international legitimacy in addition to the military, the huge military advantage that it gave the Assad regime because it effectively gave forces that supported him control of the skies in the conflict as well. I know that many of the rebels at the time were asking for a no-fly zone in the country, for example, um, to be imposed by other similar nations. to similar to Libya, then potentially, yeah. I mean, it's you know, it, it's difficult to say how things. I don't think we should really go and say how things might have gone down if if things had been different. But um, that is what uh, forces, opposition forces, were requesting at that time. But I think, unfortunately, Russia's intervention in that regard pretty much scuppered that uh, that chance. You have extraordinary scenes when you have US planes and US and, and Russian warplanes coordinating with each other because you have US planes bombing Daesh positions in the north of the country, supporting Kurdish militias. And then you have Russian planes moving south to bomb rebel positions and civilians, uh, which again is documented. But you have these air forces actually coordinating with each other to make sure they don't encroach on each other's airspace as they're going on their various sorties. You know, it's just extraordinary. It's it's a mess. Um, but you can see the, the unwillingness uh, of other members of the international community to intervene. I think to me that discovering that that was happening was the moment that kind of reinforced to me that no, there's not going to be anything happening here to assist people. Well, at Redaction, we will be keeping you uh, fully updated on the developments in the Syrian war. Our Middle East and North Africa editor here, Kit, uh, is working on stories on this as we speak. So please keep an eye out on www.redactionpolitics.com. Let's move on to our next topic of the day then. Um, Kit, a week or so ago, you wrote an editorial for Redaction. Uh, about the state of transphobia in the British establishment. Uh, this was inspired by a defeated amendment to that contentious police crime and sentencing bill that's currently being debated in the UK Parliament, 
there's plenty of objectionable measures in this bill. Uh, there's a whole topic for a whole podcast there in due course. But uh, one objection that was proposed in the House of Lords was that prisoners uh, would be treated along the lines of the sex they were assigned at birth when being incarcerated. Um, transphobia is rife in the UK, let's make no mistake. Reported hate crimes against trans people have surged in the nation over the past few years, and yet still many members of the British Commentariat are insisting on demonising the trans community. Kit, what did you discover while researching this editorial? Well, I think the first thing is when you are speaking about trans people being put into prisons according to their uh, sex that they were assigned at birth, one of the justifications that was put forward for this in the House of Lords was that it was to protect women in women's prisons. And the implicit uh, argument in there is that trans women in a women's prison would constitute a threat to the women who were being incarcerated there. And I think this is a problem because there is an assumption in that that the trans people that are being kept there are somehow more capable of sexual violence, basically. There's an assumption that that would be why they're imprisoned in the first place, if that makes sense, even though there's just a myriad and literally any other reason that someone could be incarcerated for, you know, uh, more and less serious crimes, there seems to be some kind of implicit assumption that that would be what it was if it was a trans person that was in prison, which is a huge problem. Um, you get similar kind of demonization about people being um, uh, characterized as like, sexual predators and perverts and unnatural threats to children, all that kind of um, horrible rhetoric. This has previously been deployed against other marginalized groups. It's been deployed against gay and bisexual men, for example, um, who are have previously in the past been painted as implicitly predatory just by the nature of, of who they are, right? This is the first big problem, I think, is the assumption uh, that if a trans person is in prison, it's because of a sex-related crime, which is, of course, not true. It's a complete fallacy. The second thing is that um, it completely misunderstands that trans people are far more likely to be a victim of sexual violence than they are to be a pro uh, perpetrator of it as well, or a victim of violence, or any kind of violence, really, and then they are to be a perpetrator of it. So what, what these kind of measures would or could result in if they had actually gone through would be placing people in a lot of danger. Um, you can imagine being a female presenting a trans person in a male prison. I mean, that's not gonna be a very welcoming or supportive environment, is it really? Um, can, I jump in and can I jump in and clarify there that Pink News uh, reported uh, when covering this uh, amendment that if the amendment had passed, it would have, uh, or at least could have resulted in separate accommodations specifically for trans prisoners. So it might not have necessarily resulted in trans women going into men's prisons, but you know the point still stands when we're talking more broadly about transphobia, of course. Definitely. Um, I think even just having a kind of separate um, prison for trans people is also a problem. Um, because at what point do you start defining someone as falling into that category, okay? Um, is it only when someone has, for example, started transitioning that you would put them into that category? Um, or is it someone who's currently experiencing gender dysphoria but hasn't necessarily started any kind of um, hormone, hormone replacement therapy or other gender reassignment um, procedures that you can have, right? At what point do you start to... Um, think well maybe this person should be in here on the other hand as well it's also not on the other hand um as well it's also um i think quite a dangerous thing to be putting people into a completely separate space um because of the way that they're identifying and because of the way that they're uh, the relationship that they have with their own gender and their identity um especially when it could just as easily be sorted by having people in the prison that they are 
um, identifying with in terms of their gender identity, right? I think it's just, it was put forward as a way of perhaps alleviating that, but in that there may even be a tacit acknowledgement that maybe it wouldn't be a good idea to have pe trans people in the same prisons, right? In, in, in the prison that they're assigned for the gender that they were assigned at birth, right? There's an acknowledgement there that maybe this is dangerous, maybe this isn't safe. Aside from all the other stuff of at what point do we define that someone is is trans and at what point um, does this kind of stop as well? Do you then start saying, well, we can't possibly have gay people in prisons because they might perform, they might, you know, constitute a threat to other prisoners? It's pandering to a kind of fear, it's pandering to um, it's pandering to a transphobia, which I think is often a kind of gate um, to coin a to coin a term, a kind of gateway phobia into one of the very unpleasant things as well. Yes, I often find that if you look at the parallels between the moral panic, um, the transphobic moral panic we see today, and the homophobic and biphobic moral panic we saw back in the 80s, you know, it raises very serious questions about the historical literacy of the so-called gender critical crowd when you consider uh, those staggering parallels. Well, I mean, there's two examples of this that I can give. The first one was um, a TikTok creator who did an experiment on the app with the, the algorithm. Um, and this creator, she made an, a new account and then would only uh, interact. So the way the algorithm works, when you interact with a video, it shows you more videos like that. That's kind of it, basically. It says if you like this, you might also like this. Um, and she only interacted with uh, content that was... Um, transphobic content or labeled itself as gender critical content and it took her I think the experiment said it took her about two days to end up on the side of TikTok that pushes um, ideologies like white supremacist ideologies basically so it's kind of the apps almost saying like oh you like this content you might also like this content um, this took about it did not take long to kind of arrive on that side of TikTok um, just interacting with those kind of transphobic videos, with those videos labeling themselves gender critical. Uh, I think that's a really good example of just how social media can kind of reinforce that and create that kind of echo chamber that pushes people who might otherwise hold quite liberal views or apart on lots of other different issues, for example, um, racism, for example, sexism, for example, you know, uh, homophobia. And then push a lot of those other ideas in there just because of this one thing that someone who might not be like a sort of die hard um, gender critical person, um, but is just has some questions basically. I think that's very dangerous. The yeah, second it one is similar, think, similar yeah. that we saw. Sorry, just to jump in there. Again, that's not a new story. We saw that about mm. this time seven years ago, roughly 2015 ish. Yeah. Uh, at a time when you had that whole, anyone who's very online like, like me will remember the whole anti-SJW uh, mm. backlash and this whole cohort of uh, quote-unquote anti-SJW uh, YouTubers, people like Sargon of Akkad. Uh, yes, a grown man who goes on the internet and actually calls himself Sargon of Akkad. Um, people like that uh, who were promoting these sort of anti-SJW talking points that, you know, you had some liberally, liberally minded people who might find, you know, what might be called the quote unquote politically correct, what we today call woke, I guess, um, sides of uh, the left more unappealing. And then slowly and slowly that content becomes more and more radical to the point at which uh, the algorithms are pointing you, like you say, directly uh, towards white supremacy and alt-right ideologies. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think it's very disturbing that we're seeing a similar thing happening with transphobic content on these platforms now as well. I think the second thing as well is that the parallels, um, like you mentioned, that uh, anti-trans activists uh, have with a lot of anti-gay and anti-bi um, activists that we've seen in the 1980s and 1990s as well, definitely. So one final thing we're going to be talking about today is um, one of the biggest topics uh, in geopolitics today, that is uh, the tensions on uh, the Russia-Ukraine border. Um, there have been 
would have been called quote unquote frank talks between um Secretary of State Anthony Blinken for the United States and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov um, about the buildup of Russian troops on the Ukrainian border. Some 100,000 Russian military personnel are now stationed around that border. Um, there are many who believe that an invasion of the Ukraine by Russia is imminent. Of course, back in 2014, Russia occupied uh, the Crimean Peninsula and subsequently annexed it. Um, parts of eastern Ukraine have been under occupation by separatist forces who are pro-Russia since then as well, although they have not, uh, at time of recording, acceded to the Russian Federation. Um, what have you made of this so far, Kit? Do you think we're looking at a potentially um, deadly situation here in Ukraine? Um, I, I wouldn't be in a position to say either way, really. What I have seen from the reports that I've, I've, I've watched and that I've read is that there is definitely a will to fight in Ukraine as well. Um, I think one, one report I've seen, I think, from Channel 4 News was, was uh, interviewing people who were uh, training with assault rifles, that were training in guerrilla tactics. Uh, you also have a Ukrainian president who's saying very bluntly, yes, I will fight. Um, so there is definitely a will to fight in Ukraine as well. This, um, the buildup of troops on the border in Russia is very disturbing. Um, I do think that Germany's uh, unwillingness uh, to perhaps foster a more um, uh, hard opposition to Russia's actions uh, may well embolden them. I do know there's other uh, other European countries, I think, have now moved away from that stance, haven't they? They've moved um, not against Germany, but away from Germany's position in that regard. I believe the Netherlands. Uh, that, yeah, that's it. Has, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think certainly from Ukraine, the, the impression that I get is that there definitely is a will to fight in Ukraine and that if Russia does move soldiers into uh, westward into Ukraine, then they are going to be opposed. Thank you, pardon. I was on mute there for a second. Uh, one thing we were talking about just before we came uh, here and started recording um, is a statement put out by a UK organisation called uh, Stop the War Coalition. Uh, I'm just going to read out a part of this and we're going to break this down. So they say British politicians are playing with fire, stoking up the tension around Ukraine. As the danger grows of a conflict breaking out between Russia and Ukraine, following an apparent lack of progress in negotiations with the USA, Tories and Labour are outbidding each other in pointless bellicosity. The government has sold fresh weaponry to Ukraine, and Foreign Secretary Liz Truss has made a sabre-rattling speech in Australia. Shadow Ministers David Lammy and John Healy have flown to Kiev to support Ukrainian resistance to Russia. Britain should be advancing serious diplomatic proposals to defuse the tension and seek a solution to the crisis rather than ratcheting it up. This involves taking both Ukraine's integrity and Russia security concerns, so, sorry, Russian security concerns seriously. Let's break this down then. Russian security concerns. What are we talking about here? Um, it's very difficult to say, I think, with Russia's security concerns. Um, the, the instinct would certainly be to, to wonder how valid they are in, in a domestic setting in Russia or whether it's, this is um, actually uh, trying to find an excuse, maybe, uh, Russia trying to find an excuse to, to move westwards. Um, whether there is a, a movement in Ukraine, whether there's a group in Ukraine that would have the capability of actually threatening Russia, for example, in uh, in major Russian cities is up for debate, I think. Um, so my immediate instinct would be to think, well, is this trying to find an excuse? Absolutely. Um, and some context is that one of President Putin's demands um, is that Ukraine be barred from joining NATO. Um, obviously, there are countries on Russia's border, such as the Baltic states that are NATO members, and are members uh, of the European Union. 
Um, Putin obviously doesn't want NATO influence spreading further east. But to use the term security concerns, I think is a little loaded when I think the country that has to be the most concerned about its security right now is uh, the Ukraine itself. And, you know, any anti-imperialist worth the name should be fighting first and foremost for Ukraine's right to self-determination right now. I think that should be unequivocal. And if that means, um, you know, offering direct uh, support in arming Ukraine to help it defend itself, I think um, that is a legitimate position to take as an anti-imperialist. Well, I think the, the, the first thing to look at would be to look at the response that the UK has had from uh, Ukraine as a result of that. Um, we haven't seen much of it on the news cycle in the UK because we've had other stories that have been uh, preoccupying the news cycle. It's been very uh, inward looking. Uh, but if you look on social media, for example, um, I've seen that on uh, social media in Ukraine, you have uh, God Save the Queen has been trending uh, as a result of um, which gives you which gives you some impression of the, uh, the reception that those arms sales have had in the country that they're being sent to. Um, I think the, in any of this, this kind of scenario, the first thing that you should look, look at is the country which is being threatened. You should listen to the people that are living there that are directly um, on the, the front line of this, uh, this development, possibly quite literally in this case. Um, if that's being welcomed on the ground there, I think there's something to be said for it. If that's what Ukraine, if Ukraine is approving of that to continue its self-determination, to oppose um, the Russian aggression, the buildup of troops on the border, then definitely it might be something to, to continue and it may be a good move. Well, time is going to tell here, unfortunately, uh, whether Russia invades Ukraine um, is something we'll find out in due course. That's all we have time for today, folks, I'm afraid. But thank you very much for tuning in once again. Um, I've been your host, James Moles, editor of Redaction Report. I've been joined by Kit Roberts, Middle East and North Africa editor of Redaction Report. If you've enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. Uh, follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We're on the full works. And until next time, we'll see you soon.